Oh. Uh. Oh. Hello, and welcome to part three of a multi-part series that I have Casey to thank for, because they had to downsize part of their computer collection and were passed on to me through LGR. And I have to say thank you to both of them, but especially Casey for the really awesome things that he gave me uh, today as I'm recording this intro again at the same time as the last two. But in this video, uh, well, now in the last two videos actually, uh, we took a look at both these towers and what's in these boxes, and at this time I envy you for knowing what's in these, and I, I don't right now because I'm still recording all three intros on the same day, but uh, for this probably last video here, at least for a little while until we come up with some specific use cases for these things, uh, I want to take a look at what I had left out there that compact bag, which actually has a compact portable three in it. And uh, unlike everything else here that I didn't touch before I started on the videos, that I actually tried powering it up and I think there is some hope for it. Okay, so uh, this is the compact portable three and I'm actually recording this video as I'm doing it as a live stream, because uh, I just picked up some other interesting stuff that I'll give you a sneak peek of here a couple of days ago that is now very distracting for me. And it turns out this computer may not be uh, too easy to get working. So I wanna just take a look at uh, what it's going to need to be made functional and uh, kinda get a feel for how bad off it is. Cause it has some issues that I'm I know I could fix, but I'm gonna have to order some parts for, and some things I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to fix. So let's go ahead and get into this. So this is the carry case for the Compact Portable 3, which is uh, really awesome for me to get because I have my Compact Portable 1 back there with some other distracting things there, and I do have the carry case for that. So it's kind of cool I have the carry case for both the 1 and the 2 here, but if we get this open, we can pull out the Compact Portable 3, and we can see it there. This system is more of a lunchbox computer in the style of the Sharp PC 7000 that I previously did a video on, and uh, there are some other similarities right off the bat to that one. If we get into here and look at the keyboard cable, we can see that it's actually starting to fray. The material is drying out and becoming super brittle and cracking. So I'm going to have to replace this cable, which means that I'm going to have to find a cable with a sufficient number of conductors. It looks like four plus one ground wire. Um, so I'm gonna need to get that, and then I'm going to need to coil it, which I have done with the Sharp PC 7000, and I do actually have a better understanding of what inverting the coil means, so uh, that will be easier to do. Now, unlike the Sharp PC 7000 I have, this has a uh, very interesting screen, and it's not just because you pop it out and have it tilt up like that, which is pretty awesome by itself, but that is actually a plasma screen, and it is really cool, but not totally perfect. All right, I'm going to get this powered on, and let's see, you can see the delightful orange glow there. Oh yes, it passes the RAM test up to 640K. I don't know if that's all it's got, and then we get to this screen, which shows us a couple of issues. So first off, it's saying error 162, system options not set, and it wants a diagnostic disk. So there isn't a BIOS configuration utility built into this computer in a ROM. You actually have to load it off of a floppy disk, which is kind of really dumb and cheap. <laughs> That's really annoying um, that it can't even just be set with dip switches on a little panel that you open in the back, but oh well. Um, so I didn't get it with a diagnostics disc, so I'm gonna have to make one, which won't be the biggest issue. You can actually still download the diagnostics disc from Hewlett Packard, um, which is kind of crazy. They bought Compaq and were responsible for their uh, support for a while. So yeah, they may even still make them, but they're 
they're definitely not like a full-on computer brand. They're probably mostly rebadged computer stuff. But that's one problem. If we look over here, we can see that is an open parentheses, but that should be a closed parentheses, and uh, that should just be a space, but they don't look quite right. Now, I'm not sure if this is a panel problem or if this is something with the character ROM, um, but I do actually have a way of checking that we can try here. Uh, I wanted to connect this to an external monitor to see if I could get clean video out in another way uh, to see if it's the panel or if it's something in the video generation circuit, but uh, I'm not sure if the video out's working. So I'm gonna drag out my other compact portable and we'll try that. All right, so since I'm not sure of the Compact Portable 3's CGA port even being active, let alone working uh, during the boot, I connected my Compact Portable 1 here to my CGA capture system, and I can actually show you. So I do know that the CGA capture system is working, so it should theoretically be able to capture video from the Compact Portable 3, but it could be like the Compact Portable 1 here, where if I restart it, uh, the video is going to drop out and it won't actually activate until it gets a proper CGA output because it's really weird in how it handles all that stuff. So as much as I would like this to be a good test uh, of the monitor, this may not be. Should have a 1.2 meg drive, should it? Oh, that's interesting. Okay, well... That's good to know. The uh, setup disk for it was uh, 360K, which was part of what was making me think that it was the low density drive, but okay, that's good to know. Okay, I've got this connected to the CGA capture system that I definitely know is working now, and we'll see if we can get anything out of this, and uh, no, I'm not getting anything on all of the capture hardware over there. So, uh, this does not do video out, or the video out's broken, uh, which is possible, so. Yeah. Okay, so I grabbed my FreeDOS boot disk, so I'm gonna take the sticker off, uh, just because it keeps peeling off on me. Um, and we can go ahead and press F1 to continue. It's going to check for a disk, not find one. I'm gonna put it in here. Go ahead and press a key to continue. And it will not be able to read it. The light over here does some stuff but uh, it doesn't actually work, and it will ask for a system disk. So, yeah. So this disk, I know for a fact works because I just booted this on my compact portable yesterday after trying it in this computer. But the real thing is that when I try and boot a disk on here, I don't hear it spinning. So I'm now starting to wonder if this may have a belt that's bad which would be really <laughs> annoying. And we would then be up to needing to fix the keyboard cable, something with the display, and the belt in the floppy drive. But we're really only gonna know if it's a bad belt if we get it open. So let's go ahead and do that next. As I'm doing this video live on Twitch here, uh, I had someone ask me about trying to set the video out and I'm mentioning again that it has the diagnostic disc for configuring the settings and it's really annoying and you might think like, oh, it's an old computer, so you know, it wouldn't have had a BIOS menu built in, but my Sharp PC 7000 does. <laughs> and it can be run at any point while the computer's on, not just during the boot up. So there really isn't an excuse for this thing to need this. This is compact cheaping out on the computer through and through. So yeah, it is very annoying that it needs a diagnostic disc to be able to change system settings. It's yeah, just really annoying. I think I've talked enough about this computer that I decided I should just go get it. This is the Sharp PC 7000 that I have, and uh, this is a much older computer, um, one that I actually had to make a custom cable for, just like I'm gonna have to make for the uh, Compaq over here. But this is an 8086 system, it is much older, it does have CGA um, capabilities and it should uh, boot up and then I can demonstrate to you the menu that it has, which is better. Although the display is horrible. It is awful. And did the backlight die? 
Loading. Okay. Or am I wrong and it's just weak? Oh, it's just really weak. Now, for comparison, this is the BIOS configuration tool that is built into the Sharp PC 7000. And you activate this with a simple press of a key right there. That is all that you have to do. Um, you can press the key and it will switch over to that menu at any time while it's booted. So not having that on the Compaq Portable 3 is a bit frustrating. But uh, I was just informed by one of the viewers here, which is part of why live streams are kind of awesome, that it might be possible to open this up and configure some dip switches. So let's go ahead and take a look at that on the Portable 3. Before we open it up, these are the only expansion ports it has. Parallel, serial, and RGB, or probably just CGA video out. Um, it has over here an expansion port, but I think that's just cast into the full panel. No, that looks like it is actually separate. Um, so this may, aha, there we go. Um, if this is like the 7000, this will probably have a full ISA connection to the computer, and it may even have another serial port or, and a parallel port for just slapping like a whole printer on the back of this computer or a modem or something like that, because um, that's frequently how these tended to work at this time. Let's see, I just noticed there is a sticker on the bottom, and it looks like the model is 2660, and uh, I don't see a date, but that is something I can look up later. There's possibly another expansion bay down there. Um, that, I bet, is for an internal modem. That would be my guess. To get into here, I'm going to have to remove some Torx screws. They're not even security ones, so that's nice. So let me find the correct bit for that. Crack this open. Ooh, whoa. Okay. That's, uh, that's good to know. That's a substantial screw. That came off like I suspected. And if we get in here, we should be able to find the 286, I bet. Although I'm not seeing it. Is it that or is it that? Well, I see Intel right there on the uh, side of the chip and I'm not willing to peel off the sticker that is from Compaq on there, so I'm just gonna go ahead and leave that, but uh, yeah. I would also almost think this is a battery bay, but it's definitely meant to hold slots for cards. So you could put some kind of cards in here, because if, if we look in here, you can see there's some grooves, and those are clearly meant to hold cards. You can see them there, and then this pops out uh, from the front. So that's an interesting card bay. Again, I suspect a modem would go in there, but I'm not sure why you'd need two cards unless there's the modem's just really tall. 286 is below the 287 socket under the shield. Oh, okay. So unless I need to get under that for the dip switches, which I'm guessing not because I see some stuff over there, um, then I don't think we'll end up seeing it. <laughs> That's also annoying, no 287 in there. Wait a minute. I have a 287. There we go, Intel 287. So I should just be able to pull this out and pop it right there to give this all the floating point math stuff. Um, but we'll do that once we get it working. Uh, but that's really nice to know that I can't actually upgrade this. That is so cool. So I just noticed this comes loose and pops off and then we have this shield here and then down in there, that's a hard drive and I'm guessing that's IDE. So this thing probably has an operating system on there and that makes sense because I believe Casey told me this was a 20 megabyte hard drive in here it just wasn't trying to boot from it at all. So I figured it didn't have one and maybe should have had one, but uh, yeah, so I'm not sure what's going on, why it's not even attempting to boot from the drive. We might need to make a configuration disc and have it load it. Um, since I have access to the floppy port right there, it might make sense to just connect a GoTech directly to it and load the disk image for the configuration with that and then see if we can boot the drive because 
I mean, it's right there. It's ready to go. It could only be that the floppy drive is bad, which, I mean, I could put stuff onto it with the GoTech and then see what happens. But uh, yeah, that's a unexpected thing. I really figured it didn't have one since it wasn't even trying. But before that, I want to take a look at the dip switches on the back here because I want to make sure that I can't set this to output video while I'm working on it because that would be really nice. Now this is really cool. There is a jumper block right there, but the settings for it are all on the stickers in this back panel here, which are really handy. Uh, so you don't need a manual to reference while you're working on this. And it's also interesting, uh, this thing you can see here is bare plastic, but then this is a metal coating. So this is probably like a, I don't, I'm not sure what they would have sprayed this with as a magnesium alloy material coating. It's for radio interference stuff, it's kind of weird. But uh, I want to see if there is a video output option here. So let me see. So seven, both plasma display, dual mode, plasma display and monochrome mode. So if seven is off, seven is on. Uh, okay, plasma display in dual mode. Okay, there's an asterisk, factory setting. Okay, so the plasma display is, it, it should be outputting video over CGA. All right. Well, I'm guessing it's the same kind of issue as the uh, original compact portable then, that it's kind of funky with how it sets up the video display and until you give it a application that's actually running in like native CGA modes and it may not output proper video. So I'm gonna guess that's what's going on because I don't, I don't know why else it wouldn't show it. Let's see, you need to find some replacement for that huge lithium battery block without bio settings or get lost every time. Oh, is that what that is? That's a battery? Ugh, gross. I don't like that. There's stuff all around it. I'm hoping it's just hot glue um, and not like leaky battery. Uh, you can pull the battery right off, it's plugged straight into the board. Is it? But it's glued down, so that makes me... Well then, that was easy. Uh, okay, let's just not put that back in. I'm taking a break, getting pictures of these labels so I can edit them into the video uh, for while I'm talking about stuff. And just so you guys know, I'm doing some uh, 3D printing in the stream here because uh, I need some supports for my Raspberry Pi LCD because it got cracked while I was moving. So if you can hear 3D printing in the background on my lapel mic, even though it's like five feet away from there, <laughs> um, that's what's going on. Okay, this cable, okay, there is some slack. I was afraid that this cable was gonna be really hard to move, but I was able to pull some slack out, so I should be able to just pop it out then. Um, all right, so we're gonna connect uh, this, the GoTech, to right there, which will be all nice and handy. And I'm gonna go ahead and take the drive out here and put the diagnostic disk image on it. I'm putting a 720K uh, disk image onto the flash drive for the GoTech that may be bootable on here. Um, I think that's a 1.2 meg drive from what I've heard. So it should theoretically be able to use a 720K disk then. So let's find out. So I'm powering the GoTech separately. It's grounded through the floppy cable, so that's fine, whatever. Um, I'm not worried about that. I'm gonna give power to the Compaq and we'll see how this goes. If this doesn't work, then I will try like an, a DOS 5 boot disk and see if this will actually boot off that. So what we're looking for is for the numbers to change on there. Okay, this rebooted. So when it starts ac accessing the disk, those numbers should change to reflect the sectors or the tracks that it's trying to read. So it just seek the head. Could see that, okay. F1 key to resume. Um, it did something, it's trying to read it. Load failure. Well, that's new, at least. I like new, um, but that's not working. But I do like new. Let's try a DOS boot disk. Or you know what, let's try the free DOS disk image. That's expected. Beep, beep. I like beep, beep. I really like seeing periods. That's booting. Error. That's weird. Uh, all right, I'm gonna put a downloaded MS-DOS disk image on here that is 
not imaged from anything else. And we will try that. Okay, if this doesn't work, then there is something else wrong with the setup because this should work. Uh, this is a 360K disc image and it's asking for an operating system disc. So this should be what it wants. Well, it wants a, when it complains about the setup options being wrong, it's asking for the other disc, but it'll actually try and boot an operating system disc after that. So if this doesn't work, then we have a different problem. Non-system disc, that is absolutely a system disc. What are you talking about? Okay, there's something funny going on here. Let me see if I can find a 1.2 meg MS-DOS disk and load that. And then if that doesn't work, I really don't know what to do. Right now I'm trying different disk structures to see if the uh, drive is just expecting something in particular. Um, but whoa, here we go. Okay, it looks like we have a dead vertical line. Your computer does not have a hard disk or it's not functioning correctly. I think it's the latter. <laughs> Wow, that is so weird. It had to be a 1.2 meg disc. That is the weirdest thing I think I've ever seen for a floppy problem. I just tried a bunch of different versions of the actual diagnostic disc images and different DOS images, and I got it to boot off of a GoTech with only a DOS 622 1.2 megabyte disc image. The only distinction that I can fathom between any of the other things that I've tried in this is that the 1.2 meg disk image would run at 360 RPM compared to 300 RPM for all of the other disk formats. So apparently there's something wonky going on with this thing where it only wants to boot off of 360 RPM disks, which is just really weird and I've not encountered anything else like that. Unfortunately, uh, DOS 622 here is not detecting a hard drive, so let's just for giggles here um, see if we can run fdisk and if it will detect any hard drive that just needs to be formatted or no fixed disk present at all. Okay, so that hard drive that's in there is apparently not showing up at all, so we really need to dig into the whole drive area and figure out what's going wrong in this because some stuff's clearly not right. Uh, now, looking at the drives over here, it seems like that one screw may be all that's needed to be removed to get the drive bay out. The cables have some slack to them, uh, so they might be folded under and then just slide out. So if I jam this there and press, it moves. The whole thing is moving, okay. So it's not just that it's like stuck or something. These cables aren't really sliding with it all either. If I can get them slightly off of each other, then it may... Yeah, there we go. <sighs> oh, all right. There's all the drives as a unit. Yeah, so that hard drive cable might not uh, be doing so great. Um, that's unfortunate. <sighs> hmm. I don't really have a good tester for that, but uh, the sniff test <laughs> says it's broken. I don't think I feel a vibration on the hard drive, so I'm going to guess it's toast. Oh, never mind. I definitely hear it. Beep, beep. Go tech. I think it's booting. Okay, so we'll see if the hard drive gets detected by DOS. Cannot install. I don't think it's seeing the hard drive, but it's very fair that it's not detecting the hard drive. Wait, you can run the, di the configuration disk within an operating system? Durr. I think this will be, that's different. Type read me. I think this is the setup disk or the diagnostic disk, the compact disk. <laughs> Failure reading drive A. So RPM issue again probably. I bet it was able to read the table of contents. So it reads the talk which is probably close enough to size and speed that it's not an issue. 
This is the dumbest, weirdest problem ever. So we are actually into the Compaq Portable 3 configuration settings here, and I have uh, Helen Croft, who is one of the viewers and a mod on my Twitch channel for helping me with this. So that is excellent. Uh, I'm gonna set the current date uh, to, what did I do? Oh no, ah, sure, why not? Oh, hello, uh, choose which drive. Oh, okay. Well, that could be interesting. Caution, proper selection of diskette drive type for this drive is critical in order to retain the ability to boot from the disk. So I'm guessing that if I set it to anything but 1.2 meg, then I could boot off of 360K disks. I'm gonna leave it at 1.2 meg for now, but I know now that we can boot this and potentially fix it. So that's nice. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna set it to 1.2. We know what the problem is. The hard drive is the biggest issue. So fix disk not installed. That's what we need to change. F4. Fixed disk drives. Um, fixed disk controller, fixed disk one. Type zero indicates no new drive. Press F1 for list of drive types. Uh, I'm gonna do type two since I was, so it's weird. It has specific drive types that it wants you to set. Um, I'm gonna set drive type two. That, oh, that's way better. I'm gonna set drive type two since I was told it's 20 meg. I can always change it later. So escape, type two, not 22, type two. I think I'm gonna unplug the GoTex floppy or flash drive because that will have it read no disk and drive. Non-system disk. Okay, so it didn't boot the hard drive, so there's that. All right, I put in the flash drive. I'm gonna move over to the second disk image, which should be DOS 622. If we can't recognize a hard disk here, I'm gonna boot, or I'm gonna run the setup program again and see if the settings do not persist. Oh no. I'm gonna guess the settings don't persist beyond a reboot. I hear the hard drive spinning up and then slowing down, and spinning up and then slowing down. configuration options were automatically updated. Oh, that's weird. So it did take it. Oh, it's not detecting the drive. How, how, wow. I would think the electronics on the drive would at least report. If I wanted to put a different sized drive in there, is that even possible? Fixed disk drives, um, F1 for list of drive types. There's page up, page down, which I didn't actually look through before. Page down. 47 is 61 megabytes. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of weird ones. Other fixed disk suppliers may uh, supply types not listed above. Interesting, okay. Uh, 22 is 42.9. Oh, this is so weird. Well, okay, we still have one more option. We haven't tried powering the drive externally. Let's do that. I should have set it to a type there, but I, oh well. I'm just not optimistic. <laughs> so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna let this do whatever it's gonna do. Um, set to dot boot DOS, and then we'll run setup. And then we will try uh, changing out the hard drive once this does not work. Okay, big box of hard drives. Oh, there's a lot of hard drives. Okay. Ah. Uh. All right. Yeah, I think it just did not work at all, F disk. Well, we didn't save. It had disabled it. Oh, uh, I think, you know what? I think we need to change to the diagnostic disk, run setup, change it back to 22, save it, and then reboot, because with it powered externally. Okay, what do we got? That Mac store is way too new. It's gonna be humongous, okay. Uh, this is 639 meg. That's the smallest one so far. Boom, boom. Yep, you wiped my disk settings. F4. Disk drives. Um, oh, that's not what I wanted. Maybe later, but uh, fixed disk drives. Types, F1. Okay, 2, 12, 651. 
Would that potentially work? Do 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 do. No fixed discs present. Okay, so we're gonna shut it off. Boom. We're gonna put the caviar on over here. And uh, then we'll see what happens. Oh my gosh, I'm about to hit five hours. It's almost, oh wow. Okay, I'm not thrilled with that. Did it detect the hard drive? I think it did. F disk. I think that drive works and it likes it. It is very happy with it. Mega, it even detected the kind of drive that's it. Boom, it worked. So the original Connor drive is dead and a different drive like this Western Digital Caviar 2635, which also came from Casey, is actually usable here. Okay, so we do need to actually go and run setup. Okay, I get it. The, the partition table is 610 and it reads that from the data on the hard drive. Okay, I'll, I'll set as type 49, restart, and then I guess we'll sys the drive and copy stuff over just to boot it off of the hard drive once and feel all warm and fuzzy. All right, to make this computer at least do something with the hard drive, we're gonna rerun the Compaq utility here um, and change the drive type to 49 because uh, it is only detecting 40 megs of hard drive. So that's not right. Um, and if we go through the list again here, type 49 is 651 megabytes, which is smaller than that or bigger than that drive. So that should work. So we can do 49 as the drive size. Unknown drive type entered, please enter. Uh, it's in your list. Okay, so Brian the electrician here is actually watching the stream and is advising me to choose a smaller drive type. Um, wait, what is going on here? These are the options it's giving me. It just get... <laughs> okay, the camera's kind of far away. Um, but it gave me type 49 as an option and it's negative 180 point negative five megabytes. <laughs> so, um, let me redo that. Uh, I went to fix disk drives and then it gives me these options instead of typing for some reason. And 49 is an option even though it told me earlier that's not valid. Um, but I think I'm going to go with that and see what happens. <laughs> Let's see if maybe the BIOS is less intelligent than DOS itself, and doing that will work. So, yep, no drive. Okay, so we're going to have to pick a smaller drive size. So I'll go through and pick whatever the next smallest one is. Compact, okay, we're setting this to like a very reasonable drive, like 200 megabytes or something, because I want to be done here. <laughs> So we're gonna go F1 list, and I'm just gonna pick whatever a pretty big drive is. Okay, display partition. We have 300 megs free, okay. So we're gonna close that out. We're going to delete active partition, delete non-DOS, because it's probably like FAT32 or something. So we're gonna do we wish to delete that. Yep, partition deleted, escape. Okay, create DOS partition primary. Use the whole thing. Oh yeah, all 300 megs of the whole thing for sure. Mm-hmm, definitely. Now it's gonna reboot. But okay, I'm now going to drop down to DOS. We're going to format C slash S. And that should format it. Um, and put the command prompt and uh, uh, the, the kernel hidden files on there because the DOS hides its actual boot kernel files from you on there, um, but that should make it bootable. Okay, we've got the drive formatted. I'm gonna name it DOS test. And theoretically, this should be a bootable system now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to the GoTech and I'm gonna unplug the flash drive because that is kind of how you set a GoTech to have no disk in the drive. And we're just gonna try and reboot this and see if it'll boot into DOS. 
Starting on track? What? Well, that was unexpected. Um, <laughs> the hard drive has on track on it to allow it to work with systems just like this. <laughs> How did that survive being formatted? <laughs> well, that's hilarious. We got uh, MS DOS on here, ver, okay, DOS 622, and we booted off of the hard drive. So the system works. It just needs a new hard drive um, and maybe some floppy stuff to happen. I'm not sure. That thing's super weird. Um, yeah, a floppy situation on this thing is going to take different exploration because that thing is, uh, yeah, not going the way I would have expected. Fat 16, 609 megs. That is hilarious. <laughs> So this whole time, if I hadn't had a floppy in it with that hard drive connected, it would have showed up as the full size. That is amazing. Oh, man, that's hilarious. Well, yeah, there we go. 609 megabytes. I wonder if a 1.2 meg boot disk would have worked in the floppy drive, and the floppy drive's actually just fine and quiet. So my not hearing it spin wasn't an issue. Hmm, I should make a 1.2 meg boot disk. This thing might be fully sorted now. All I'd have to do is just put that hard drive in the cage. Yeah. So final future plans for this system uh, will be, I'm gonna have to make a cable, but I've kind of already made a cable in a video, so I don't really need to do that. You can go watch the video on the Sharp PC 7000, which I'll put up a card here, and you can see how you'll make a cable. The only major difference is uh, once you're done, rewind the cable going the other direction, and then it will compress normally. Um, so there's that. Uh, I'm gonna swap out the Caviar hard drive for the uh, Connor drive that's in there because the Connor drive is dead and I might try and open the Connor drive and see if I can get it going but that's probably I mean I'm not optimistic about it so that'll be something that I'll probably do in a stream um, at some point but it may not make it to like a fully normal video because I don't think it's going to work <laughs> um, but other than that once I make a bootable 1.2 megabyte disk with the setup files that are needed to run the configuration, this thing should be usable without adding a battery and without making any other changes. So it should be a fully usable system with a, a different hard drive and that diagnostic disk. So I feel like this thing is actually pretty well sorted now. And uh, while this was mostly meant to just be diagnostics to figure out what's gonna need to be fixed, I, I really feel like it's usable. So I'm quite happy with this. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video, and uh, if you want to support the channel, I am on Patreon. But that is it for now, and I will see you next time.